This morning, uh, as I've already told you, we're looking at the importance of learning God's truth uh, in order that we might walk in that truth, that we may know how to please God and, of course, by His grace, want to do that. So we're going to be looking at really an Old Testament passage, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, and um, we want to look at, at verses 1 through 9. At least we want to read it to get these exhortations. One thing we need to bear in mind as well is that when our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world in order to fulfill all righteousness, what He was actually doing was what the Lord commanded His people to do in the Old Testament. You know, sometimes we see such a sharp break between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, we want to just sort of saw off the Old Testament and, and just set it aside. But that's not what the Lord would have us to do. Jesus actually came into the world to fulfill what God calls His people to do in the Old Covenant. And He does it not only to uh, save us, but also to provide an example to us of how we are to live. Now, I don't know if you've heard this recently, but I hope, I hope you remember that the book of Proverbs was actually written by the wisest man in the world outside of our Lord Jesus Christ to apply God's commandments to everyday life. And that's why the early chapters are filled with exhortations to learn wisdom. True wisdom is knowing what God commands and then actually doing what He commands. That's what Solomon is teaching his children to do. And of course, in giving us this book, the Lord is intending Solomon to teach each one of us as well. But this is what our Lord Jesus Christ actually did in fulfilling righteousness for us and we are to follow his example. So let's read what Solomon has to say in this short portion. The book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. He writes this Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father, and give attention that you may gain understanding, for I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender, and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will guard you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. Prize her, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty. Again, may the Lord bless His word to our hearing this morning. Now, I've already told you that we have been considering how important it is to have a heart that is for God and really what that means, how it is that, that we can be the friend of God, uh, someone that He can draw near to, someone that He can use. I think we understand as we look in Scripture that there are certain individuals that were singled out by God in the Old Covenant and by our Lord in the New Covenant, people that He chose to be close to Him, uh, people that He chose to use above others and certainly we've seen that there are certain characteristics that they have that sets them apart. We've seen so far that to be His friend, we do have to be those that seek to fulfill the greatest commandment, which is to love Him with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. As a matter of fact, the Lord tells us, as I've already mentioned, that He searches throughout the earth looking for someone whose heart is completely His. And what that means is it's somebody who is seeking to fulfill this commandment. And the question that that uh, reality asks us is whether or not that's what He sees in you when He looks at you. That's what you need to be cultivating. We've also seen that we need to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And why is it that God is looking for somebody who actually is doing this? Well, it's because these are the ones who are actually going to carry His work forward. 
a work that has to do with reaching others with the gospel. I mean, you have to love people in order to reach out to them, to run the risk of, you know, making somebody angry or making uh, somebody thinking that you're a fool. Uh, if you're going to reach out to them with the gospel, you have to be concerned for their soul. And the question this asks you is, do you have such a heart that loves your neighbor enough and is concerned enough about your, your neighbor's eternal well-being to reach out to them? The kind of person that God looks for, the kind of person He uses, is the kind that doesn't love the world and doesn't have the image of the world stamped uh, on, on their hearts. Because the whole purpose that God wants to use us for is to be able to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't uh, stand out from the world, if we're indistinguishable <clears throat> from the world, how can we point to the Lord? The world's going to look at us and see no difference. And that does become a reason why many people don't listen to the gospel is because they look at Christians and say, well, you're no different than I am. So why do I need to trust in the Lord? Well, the Lord is looking for somebody who is willing to stand out, who's willing to stand apart and to stand up for Him. And this asks you whether or not you are that kind of person. That's what the Lord is looking for. That's what He wants you to be. He's also looking for somebody who is willing to seek the honor that He has to give rather than the honor that this world has to give. If your heart is still in the world and you still desire the things of the world and you don't desire the things of God, then you really don't see the value of the kingdom of heaven the way that you need to see it. And you certainly don't see the vanity of this world, which is what, again, God is trying to teach you. And if you don't see the value of heavenly things and you think the world is valuable, you're not going to be seeking the things above the way that you need to. So what are you seeking? What is it that you love? You need to love the things above and the honor that comes from God, not the honor that comes from the world because that is what God is looking for. So if you want to be the kind of person that God can use, the kind of person God will use, the one who can be His friend, then you do have to have a heart for Him and not for the world. Now, what else needs to be true of you if you're to be the kind of person that God counts among His closest friends? Well, you've already seen, this morning I've already mentioned, you need to be somebody who loves His truth and somebody who is willing actually to live according to that truth. And that's what I want us to consider this morning actually and this evening, this morning, that it is important to desire that truth and this evening, that we must be willing to live by it. Otherwise, the truth we know becomes more of a liability to us rather than a blessing. So this morning, let's consider two things. And I want us to begin by considering the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, is our example in everything. And He is also our example of one who learned God's truth, who loved it, sought to understand it, sought to master it. So we want to look at that first, and then secondly, that the Lord calls us to follow that same example and to learn this truth even as Jesus did. This evening, we're going to consider how Jesus sought to obey that truth and how He also tried to help others do the same and how we needed to be doing that as well. So first of all, Jesus loved His Father's truth, and He sought to learn it. See, the kind of person we're talking about, the kind of person that God is looking for, the kind that, that He draws near to in order to support, is really the same kind of person that Jesus Christ was and, of course, continues to be today. Because who is it that loved the Father and loved His neighbor more than Jesus Christ? You know, He did that perfectly. And who hated the world and the world's glory and kept Himself unstained by this world, that he might seek his Father's glory and the honor that comes from him more than Jesus Christ. When Satan came to him and offered him the world, Jesus turned him down. When the Jews wanted to make him king, he refused. And what did he do instead? Well, he, he followed the path the Father had set out before him 
He humbled Himself and He went to the cross in order that His Father's honor might be restored so that all who trust in Him might be saved. If you want to be God's friend, if you want God to use you, you need to be this kind of person. You need to be like our Lord Jesus Christ. He is your perfect example in everything. And the example that He has given in His life that is recorded in the pages of Scripture is recorded so that you might follow Him. Now, again, we understand that doesn't mean that you are to throw on a white robe and walk around if you're a man, grow a beard and so forth, look like Jesus and walk around doing what Jesus would do in His calling. What we mean here is that you need to live as Jesus would live if He were living in your place. If you want to know what is right to do in any circumstance, just think about what Jesus would do if He were you living in your relationships, working the job you're working at, the calling that you have, making the choices that you have to make because you know what Jesus would do would be to honor the Father. It wouldn't be selfish. It wouldn't be you know, self-centered. It would be God-centered. It wouldn't be going after the world. It would be pursuing the kingdom of heaven. That is what He wants you to be doing. Now, not surprisingly... Jesus is our example in this area as well as all the others as to how we ought to love God's truth from the time that we are young to the time that we are old. Now, I mentioned earlier, sometimes we conceive of Jesus, I think, in a wrong way. We seem to think that Jesus sort of just plopped down into this world uh, fully mature, with a full understanding of God's will, with infinite knowledge, that He knew everything that there was to know, even while He was still in the womb, sort of contemplating the universe, you know, while He's waiting to be born. But that really isn't what happened with our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus in the incarnation, that is, when He takes upon Himself uh, our nature, when He becomes a man, became fully man. And in becoming fully man, He took to Himself the same limitations that we have, which means, among other things, that He actually had to learn, like the rest of us have to learn. He was raised by parents who taught Him, parents that, that actually loved God. And I think this is one of the reasons, humanly speaking, that uh, Mary and Joseph were chosen to be the family into which Jesus Christ would be born. You know, Mary was a godly young woman who loved the Lord and who studied His truth, who listened, you know, when she was being taught by her parents, listened at the synagogue as she was being taught. Joseph was called a righteous man. He was somebody who sought to walk according to God's commandments. Uh, the Father put Jesus Christ into that family because they knew that they would be faithful in teaching Jesus what it is He needed to learn. And undoubtedly, the Lord made sure that they taught Him what He needed. They also took Jesus to the synagogue, and Jesus was taught by the teachers. He listened to them read the Scriptures. He listened to them expound on what those things meant, and when they applied those things, and Jesus remembered those things, and He actually applied them. Now, I think that his desire to learn God's truth as a youth is perhaps nowhere more clearly seen than when Jesus went up to Jerusalem with his family for the Passover. Remember when he was 12 years old? When the Passover was over and the family was, was on its way back home, they had gone a full day's journey before the parents began to look for Jesus, Joseph and Mary, and they suddenly discovered he wasn't there. They just assumed that he was with one of the relatives and so you know, didn't do a head count before they left <laughs> for, you know, going back to Nazareth. But they went back to Jerusalem and they searched for Him and they found Him where they should have looked in the first place, which was in the temple, sitting with the teachers, a 12-year-old, listening to them, Luke tells us, and asking them questions. Now, sometimes we think that Jesus was there merely to teach the teachers what it is they needed to know because He had infinite knowledge. But that isn't what was going on here. Jesus was seeking to know better His Father's will, that He might honor Him. And His knowledge had already grown so much by that time that Luke says, all who heard Him were amazed at His understanding and 
his answers. And of course, his learning didn't stop there. Luke writes that he went back with his parents back to Nazareth and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, again, I want you to notice that because that proves that everything that I've just said is true. Jesus didn't come into the world with infinite knowledge. If you have infinite knowledge, you can't increase, right? You can't increase in wisdom. But Jesus kept learning. He kept growing. He kept listening to His parents he, in, as He was in subjection to them. He kept learning from His teachers, growing in wisdom until He mastered God's words. Now, we realize that an additional layer of understanding came to him when he began his ministry and he was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure. There were many things communicated to him at that time to his human understanding, but I do want you to see that in his youth, as he's growing up, he had a hunger for God's truth. And he, he, he did what many of us don't do. When he heard it, he remembered it. And when he understood it, he applied it. He is a perfect example for our young people here, and he's a perfect example for the older people who are here as to how we ought to love God's truth and seek to learn it and hold on to it so that we may apply it. Well, obviously, this is, again, what the Lord wants you to do. Jesus was doing, in, in doing what he did here, exactly what our passage is exhorting us to do this morning, which is acquire wisdom. I mean, how can you ever hope to live the kind of life that is pleasing to God if you don't know first what is pleasing to Him? Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs specifically to teach his children. And as you know, it was written not just for his children, but for all the children of God, for all of us to teach them God's wisdom. And really, who, would, who better to teach the subject like this than the wisest man who has ever lived apart from our Lord Jesus Christ Himself? Now, it is true that Solomon in this book talks more about how we are to live rather than what we are to believe concerning God. The book of Proverbs is not a systematic theology. Okay, It doesn't tell you everything you are to believe concerning God, you know, and with regard to the gospel and all of that. But basically, it is an explanation and application of the Ten Commandments, as I've already said. But I do believe that these exhortations to learn God's truth, to acquire wisdom, equally apply to everything that our Lord says. Now, again, listen to what Solomon says just in a few examples in the first nine verses of chapter 4, he actually gives an exhortation no less than 16 times in nine verses to learn wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God. And again, here's a few examples. In verse 1, hear the instruction of a father. Give attention that you may gain understanding. Verse 2, do not abandon my instruction. Acquire wisdom, acquire understanding. Verse 5, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Again, here's just a few examples, but really, in just those few examples, we have everything the Lord wants us to understand regarding what we are to do with His truth. Acquire it, remember it, don't forget it, don't let it go. Now, Solomon, as a parent, wanted to teach his children that which was most important to them, and that is how to honor God, because he knew how important it would be to their lives. Now, all of us here have had parents. Perhaps some of us had parents that actually sought to teach us. And the question is, did we listen to them? Well, why should we listen? Well, Solomon gives us several reasons here, and again, we're going to see more reasons this evening, but we don't want to miss what he does say. This is why we should listen. Because first of all, Solomon says his teaching is sound. This is something that, that, that uh, basically you can base your life on. 
Uh, people are building on different foundations, as our Lord reminds us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You can listen to His Word and build on a firm foundation, which is like rock, so that when the storms and the trials of life come, come you know, along, it's not going to destroy you. Or you can build your house or your life on a foundation of sand, something which is, is not sound. Well, that's what happens when you build it the way you want to build it or build it the way the world wants to build it or build it in any way that God tells you not to build it. If you want a firm foundation, if you want a strong foundation for your life, this is it. And this is the only foundation. Solomon says that learning and obeying this truth will lead you to eternal life. Verse 4, keep my commandments and live. You realize if you don't listen to what God has to say, it will end in death, eternal death. And can you think of anything more important in that you find life in this brief period of time that you're in this world? Now, again, I'm not saying, and Solomon isn't saying that we are saved by keeping God's law because we cannot be saved by keeping it, but we can't be saved without keeping it at the same time. We don't earn our salvation through our obedience, but unless we obey these commandments, we will not see heaven. Remember that obedience or sanctification is the evidence that we have actually come to know God. The author to the Hebrews says in the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 8 that the blessing of the new covenant includes having God's law put in our minds and written upon our hearts which means that God gives us a love for the Ten Commandments so that we might actually do them. You know that you love God. You know that you've been born again of God. You know that you're saved when you see the evidence of that love being worked out in your life through obedience. That's why we would say if you don't obey God, you're not saved. Solomon goes on to say the truth is also a safeguard to our lives in verse 6. It shows us those paths which are safe to travel, the ones that, that are good, the ones that are right. In other words, like Pilgrim's Progress, it shows us where the straight and narrow path is, and it warns us of those paths that lead down to it and away from it that we might not stray from the safe path and be able to make it safely to the end of our journey. If we take one of the side roads, as you know, when Pilgrim did each time, he got into trouble. And the same thing will happen to us every time we step off the path of God's truth. So we need to know His truth so we know where the path is, so we know where to step, where to walk, and we don't lose our way. And Solomon says that this truth is a means of exaltation. In verses 8 and 9, of gaining the honor that comes from God, which we've already seen, is one of the marks that God is looking for. As He looks with His vision, as it were, to and fro through the earth, He's looking at individuals saying, are you seeking the, the world's glory or are you seeking the glory that comes from God? And when He sees somebody that's seeking His glory, He comes down, as it were, and He supports that individual because they are looking for honor that comes from Him. Well, His truth shows us how to gain that honor that comes from Him. So even in these nine verses, we find reasons why we should do what the Lord calls us to do, aside from the fact that Jesus did it. Because His teaching lays a firm foundation for our lives. It leads to eternal life. It keeps us safe in this world and will lead us safely to the world to come and it leads to that honor that really matters. You know, again, you can gain all the honor of the world. You can gain the whole world, but if you lose your soul, what good is it? What really matters is the honor that comes from God. And so the Lord says through Solomon, acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. Jesus did this. And the Lord tells us not only that we should listen to Solomon, but that we should listen to Jesus and follow his example. Now, again, we all know how important knowledge is. We've seen many reasons why, but again, knowledge is important in any field. Again, what we're thinking here about 
how, what, you know, why it is we need to know God's truth, and it is so that we might be able to do what God calls us to do. I was thinking about just one example outside of, let's say, the Bible, of the importance of truth, the importance of knowledge when it comes to the medical field. If you need surgery, if you need surgery on a vital organ, if your life depends on the ability of that surgeon, what kind of a surgeon are you going to pick? One who knows what he's doing or one who doesn't know what he's doing? We're going to pick the one who's going to give you the best chance of survival. You're going to pick the most competent surgeon you can find. You're going to pick the one who knows his stuff, who has studied, who loves, as it were, that truth, knows the importance of that truth, has learned that truth, and knows how to apply it. But how often do, when it comes to our souls, do we not take that same care that we would take for our bodies so many today are satisfied listening to people who don't even know what God teaches or because there's a huge group of people listening to it, this guy must know and so they listen to it and they don't even bother to compare it with the Scriptures to see whether it's true like the Bereans did when Paul was speaking to them or who content themselves just sort of getting the gist of what God says but not really trying to fully understand what He says even though something far more important than your bodily health depends on it, and that is the eternal well-being of your soul. Now, we realize that though every truth is important, not all truth is equally important, right? If you're wrong about what the millennium is or when it's actually going to take place, you're still going to go to heaven if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're wrong about who Jesus is, if you have the wrong God that you're seeking to look to for salvation, or if you have a wrong idea about how God actually saves, if you believe that you're saved by your works rather than the works Jesus did you know, and received by faith, or that you can be saved without repenting of your sins, you are going to be wrong enough to miss heaven. You know, even these less vital teachings, such as the millennium, are going to have some influence upon the way that you live. The further off you are from what God actually says, the further off you're going to go. But there are some things that are vitally important that you need to know. And so let me suggest this to you as you study God's truth. First of all, study to know it thoroughly, right? All of His truth. Don't content yourself with just a notion, I think this is what the Bible says. You need to know what it says. But begin with the way of salvation. That's the most important thing, isn't it? Begin with the gospel. Make sure you understand the gospel. Make sure you understand who Jesus is, who God is. Make sure you understand the way of salvation. Make sure you understand why you need salvation and how you receive salvation. Make sure you understand what God says before you seek really to know anything else. Now, let me suggest to you secondly, and this is an area where a lot of churches are getting it wrong, study His commandments until you know them, until you know how to apply them because it does matter to God how you live. Some people uh, think, many Christians, many professing Christians think today that somehow uh, obedience is an optional thing. We even have many churches today that teach that you don't have to obey God at all. And so they, they don't tell people when they're sharing the gospel that they need to repent. Well, you realize that when the apostles went out, when Jesus himself went out, that usually the first word that came out of their mouths was repent. And what did they mean by that? Well, they meant you need to turn from your sins and you need to turn into the path of righteousness. Don't just turn, you know, change your mind about who Jesus Christ is. It is important that you believe that He is God as well as man, but you need to change your direction in life. You've been a rebel against God. You need to turn around and you need to go the right path. That's the reason why Jesus came into the world and did what He did not just as an example to follow, but that He might grant His Holy Spirit to us to change our hearts so that we would be willing 
to go that direction. Well, if that's the reason why Jesus came into the world, to turn us from rebels to obedient servants, do you think it's important that we know how to serve God? So study the gospel to know what it is that, that God requires of you in order to be saved, that you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But remember that repentance is an equal part of that. And in order to repent, you need to stop your law breaking and begin submitting to that law. Some people, you know, when they hear that, they raise the flag, legalism. You mean I have to keep the commandments in order to be saved? Well, yes, as a matter of fact. You do, but your keeping the commandments does not earn your salvation. Jesus did that. Keeping the commandments is simply the evidence that God has changed your heart and has turned you from a rebel to an obedient and loving servant. So that if you don't keep the commandments, then you're still a rebel and you still haven't been saved. So yes, you must keep them. That obedience must be there. But it's not something that earns your salvation. It's simply the evidence that you have been saved. As a believer, as someone who has received the grace of God, really, your heart will be one that wants to know what God wants so that you can do it. There is going to be that part of you that's going to be resisting, but you're going to have a heart that is yielded to the Lord. And you're going to want to obey Him, so you're going to want to know what the commandments mean and you're going to want to know how they apply. And as we're going to see more specifically this evening, you're going to want actually to submit to them. And then I would suggest learn the rest of the Bible as best as you possibly can and apply it to your life as thoroughly as you can. Because the more you can conform to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, the more you are going to be the kind of person that God is looking for, to use for His glory. And as believers, that's what we want. Now, let me just add one final thing, that in your searching for truth and in your learning, don't forget the, uh, the one truth that our Lord Jesus Christ taught His disciples, and that is to love one another as Jesus has loved you. In your studying and your learning, you need to realize, I'm sure you already do, that you're going to arrive at different conclusions. Uh, with your brothers and sisters in the Lord, you may actually find yourself disagreeing with them, though it will make a difference, of course, in the way that you live, and you're going to perhaps go a slightly different direction. Don't let it make a difference in the way that you love. We need to remember that if anyone loves and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ and is seeking to live a life that is pleasing to them according to the commandments, that brother or sister in Christ should be the object of your love and not of your hatred because you happen to disagree. Let's not forget in our learning that the Lord tells us the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbors we love ourselves. And as a matter of fact, we are even more closely bound to love one another in the body of Christ. So let's make sure that we pay attention to that commandment and that we don't divide over uh, various issues. If we are believing in the right Jesus Christ and we're repenting of our sins, then we are brethren in the Lord. So let's seek to love one another, even though we may disagree on various things. Well, may the Lord uh, help us to take this exhortation to heart. By the way, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the exhortation from Solomon, of course, is to acquire wisdom. What that means is once we've heard it, once we understand it, we need to hold on to it, don't forget it. Don't let go of it. The Lord wants us to learn His truth. So let's remember that. Let's remember why that's important. And this evening we're going to see it is most important because if we don't know what He wants us to do, we're not going to be able to do it. Well, let's follow our example in our Lord Jesus Christ to seek to know God's Word until we have mastered it. Well, let's, uh, let's spend a few moments in, in prayer and let's... Um, ask that the Lord would apply His Word to our hearts.